I know, I know, Eric, you'll, you're not someone who cares about stuff like this, but is there anything that you don't want to talk about? No, nah, no. Nah. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. All right, Michael, give us a countdown and clap. Three, two, one, clap. Three, two, one. Ariel, Ariel didn't clap. That's oh, you okay. want me to clap too? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize this was a, a three-way clap dance. Okay, sorry, sorry. Oh, it's 15 time. World champion, Demetrius Johnson. You're listening to the Mighty Cast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Mighty Cast episode four. Now, I'm super excited to have our very first guest on this beautiful podcast the mighty cast with me and michael wandover ladies and gentlemen please welcome in the great powerful earl hawani this man is round of applause round of applause uh if you guys don't know who earl hawani is you are living under a rock this man in my opinion is probably the goat of analysts probably wow yeah. okay. well excuse me Pro well god wow. damn Aaron, you're, you're messing up my flow let me finish sorry, sorry, now sorry, 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 he sorry. is excuse me that probably thank you Creo. he is one of the greatest analysts uh he covers the sport the best not just mixed martial arts but now he's getting into boxing i believe you might be covering the dylan dennis versus logan paul fight. maybe maybe i mean geez louise uh off the record conversations now out in the first one minute of this uh, oh shit DJ. my bad no, I, I, mean, I didn't know that <laughs> Don't worry, no, like, Michael, Michael can clean no, this up and it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's being discussed. It's being discussed. It's being discussed, but you have covered boxing. Uh, you've done mixed martial arts. Uh, you've been going everywhere. So it's super, I'm super grateful. I know you and Michael go way back into the ESPN days of working together. So when Michael brought it up to get you on the podcast, I was like, yeah, Ariel is my dog. And thank you so much for your time to come on the podcast and uh, hang with us, man. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Congratulations on launching this. Congratulations on all that you're doing on YouTube, as I told you uh, privately. It's very impressive. Everything from your thumbnails to the quality, the video quality. You put me to shame, and it's a little bit embarrassing that the media guy <laughs> looks like such a schlub next to the pro athlete. It's supposed to be the other way around. I am a little offended that you just revealed to the world that this was Michael's idea. I thought... I was your first choice, but apparently it's Michael's idea. Uh, nevertheless, all good. Happy to be here. It is an honor. I can't wait to get into it. And how about who would who would have thought if you would have told me back in 2018, 2019, when I first met Michael Wansover, that one day I'd be a guest on a show that he's co-hosting with the great Demetrius Johnson? Like, what a world we're living in here. This is a beautiful thing. I love everything about it. <laughs> no, no, and Ariel, Ariel, I know we can't uh, see each other right now, breaking that fourth wall, but I got a special hat on, Ariel oh, and the bad guy. yeah. That's an Showing OG that hat right the... there. That's a relic. That's that's going into the MMA Hall of Fame whenever I start that thing, all right? The real Ooh. Hall of Fame. Ooh. The great, the greatest, the greatest show in the history of ESPN, ESPN Plus. Oh yeah. Uh, just wanted, just wanted to honor that, and yeah, I'm, I, I might, I could sell this thing. I'm gonna put it on eBay after the show if anyone's interested. Wow. Put a thousand dollar price tag <laughs> on or something. <laughs> Sorry, we we haven't got a lot of uh, sponsors yet for the show, so Michael's hurting, so he's gotta <laughs> he's gotta get that on eBay to, to to make next month's rent. You had a weird transition, like me and my wife were talking about this last night. It was a weird transition where you were commentating for the UFC. And then all of a sudden you're like, they're like, where the hell's Aero Hawani? Where the hell's Aero Hawani? What like it was almost like you didn't you disappeared off the face of the UFC broadcast and the press conference and all that stuff. Then you kind of started your own thing. Like what for the viewers out there, what happened essentially? Like what <laughs> what was the story? Okay, do you have five hours or <laughs> Michael uh, doesn't want to edit that long, so we don't have five yeah. hours. I, I kind of know, <laughs> but it's all rumors, right? It's all rumors, uh, right? So for me, it's like, because literally the wife, no bullshit, Destiny was like, man, like, obviously we've always supported supported yes. you, Ariel Hawani. You know, when that whole uh, Batty the Batty Pimlet came out, and he was like... Like, Ariel Hawani in particular, like, he loves earning money off fighters. Yeah. Like... Hawani, I know how much money you f***ing get for those things. I seen the goddamn views on YouTube. It gets two hundred thirty-five thousand. That's money out of my pocket. No. I was like, nah, nah, nah. You got you're getting it all wrong. 
This is, Air Hawaiian has given us an opportunity to be able to promote our fights, promote our brand, promote our YouTube, whatever it may be. So for me, when I see athletes attacking you, where I feel every single time you give the athletes opportunity to talk about their fights, you're taking time out of your life and your, you know, regular television show, what do you want to call it, to give them opportunity to talk about what they're doing. So for me, I've always been on your side and I always will be on yes, your side. Thank you. But I think a lot of our listeners who might not know who you are want to know maybe a quick five, three to five huh. minute, you know, thing of like what happened at Hawaii. We remember I, I remember hearing this voice, but somehow it just phase it just phase out. That's all I'm just trying to tee yeah, you yeah, up, yeah. baby. No, no, look no good. I not appreciate me. it. I appreciate it. And and it is true. You've always had my back. And as I said to you uh, privately, and I've said publicly, you've never changed. And your wife has always been very, very kind and supportive as well. So uh, I, I will always have your back as well. And I've, I've, I've never forgotten how kind, and you don't need me, but you know, you've always been so kind um, and, and, and supportive. So uh, I just want to say that. Um, in short, you know, I, I, it's, it's been a crazy run, right? And um I started this in 2007 when I started my own uh, website and I just wanted to interview fighters and I wanted to show people that I could interview fighters because I was a big MMA fan and I didn't like my TV production job. I was behind the scenes and I was like, you know what? This sport is growing. It's time to go all in. So I started this website and I would just reach out to fighters via MySpace because that was the social media site du jour. And they started to reach out and I started to gain some traction and I got a job off of that and it kept growing. But actually from 2007 when I started to 2009, uh, UFC wouldn't credential me because that what I would always be told was like my site wasn't big enough, I wasn't uh, known enough, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, UFC 97 was the first time that I got uh, credentialed. And from UFC 97 all the way I would say to like, I don't know, UFC 196-ish, I had a fantastic relationship with Dana White. And I would uh, get a lot of exclusives. I would get interviews. He would give me time. And, you know, I think that it wasn't just, I wasn't just a charity case. I think he recognized that I was doing, you know, good work and treating the company um, in a professional manner, covering the company and the sport in a professional manner. Like I really, you know, I, I, I went to journalism school. I really took this seriously. Um, where, where the relationship started to change was once I started to work for Fox uh, and that was in 2012. And, you know, that was a dream come true because to that point I was never really on TV. And so now this was an opportunity to be on TV, not just Big Fox, but FS1, Fuel TV before that. But because I was living almost like this, like this double life where I'm a part of the broadcast and I'm sort of like, you know, in bed with the UFC in that regard, because that's just the way the business is. But also I have this completely independent life where I'm doing the MMA hour and I'm working for Vox and that's completely like, independent. It, it, you know, I was kind of straddling both lines. And what would happen is over time, I worked to, I worked with Fox or for Fox from 2012 to 2016, the UFC brass would get increasingly annoyed, frustrated, upset that on the MMA hour, I would talk about, you know, what I thought was just benign sports fodder business stuff like, mm. you know, free agency, pay, uh, Bellator, whatever, you know what I mean? Like just yep. stuff like that. And, and in their mind, they were like, no, 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 you're the guy that we chose to put here. Like you're either with us or you're against us. Right. And it, so there, there would be like these moments where they would get mad and then they would not get mad, mad, not get mad. Now I'm mad. 2016, March of 2016, I have uh, Rory McDonald on my show. And Rory McDonald was scheduled to fight Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in June of 2016 in Ottawa. And they offered him a new contract. He had one fight left. They offered him a new contract. And he said no because he wanted a better deal. And he decided to fight out his deal. Now, you remember Rory, like back then, like he was kind of yep. soft-spoken. He didn't really like ruffle feathers. And so yep. this was kind of a big deal. That was on a Monday. On Tuesday afternoon, uh, I got a call from my boss at Fox saying that I had been relieved of my duties. And uh, just I just like I said, that? Yeah, just like that. Oh, shit. Oh, God. And, I'm uh, it to you. <laughs> yeah, I asked why. And they said, you know, the UFC uh, demanded that you're off all the broadcasts. 
and uh, it was it the 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 Rory interview was the uh, the nail in the coffin. Like there were mm. there were definitely like there were nails, but this was the final nail, right? Yeah. Um, so. I was obviously heartbroken and I didn't feel like it was fair. I didn't feel like it was right. Like I didn't do anything bad. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything unprofessional or that would uh, embarrass the the network. And I just didn't love that it all ended on a two minute phone call. Like I really poured everything into that. Um, you know, e- even little things like my son was born and the next day I went to work. Like I, I you know, I just, it just didn't feel right. And um, from June of 2016, excuse me, from March of 2016 to June of 2016, you know, I'm a competitive guy. So I was like, all right, now the shackles are off. I'm just going to try to break every single piece of news. And I was on freaking fire. Like, this was the time where I was like, I cared about breaking every fight. And there would be moments where people would call me up and they're like, yo, this fight is happening. You got, and, and, and like people were helping me out and all this stuff. And like, but I was I was so on fire. I was like Kobe, you know, dropping eighty one on the Raptors. I was so on fire that they believed that there was a mole in the company telling me things. They believed that there was a person that was leaking information to me. On my life, I, I, I've said this a million times. Like there, there was no mole. It did not exist. That person didn't exist. It was just sources. The same, you know, you know how it is. There's managers. Yeah. There's fight. Like this is just reporting. They couldn't wrap their head around that. So what they would do is they would have meetings and they would talk about fake fights to try to catch me. But I was never on the calls. I was never on the conference calls. They would go into people's offices and ask to see their cell phone and see if they had talked to me. It, but there was nothing there. It never existed. It all, And then it all culminates in June of 2016. I'm at UFC 199. The day before UFC 199, I'm told, hey, Brock Lesnar is coming back at UFC 200. Okay, but I was told that from one good source but i have always been taught you need at least two sources to be 100 percent certain about something the next day was the saturday i got the second source so now i'm usually when i'm breaking news i'm in my room i'm in my house i'm walking the dog i'm doing something here i happen to be as fate would have it in the media room at the forum in inglewood ufc 199 so it was very kind of weird and unique i write the story and I had no idea that they were announcing it that night or what their plans were. All I know is Brock Lesnar's coming back. I'd even have the opponent. The opponent wasn't even a done deal just yet. I had heard Mark Hunt was in the mix, but it wasn't a done deal. So all I wrote was Brock Lesnar coming back UFC 200. Minutes after that came out, someone in UFC PR came and said to me, hey, you know, uh, Dana White wants to talk to you. I said, I'm good. I don't need to talk to him right now. I knew this was trouble. You know, it, yeah. it doesn't happen. Came back again, came back three times. Finally, at the end, they're like, no, you you have to go speak to him. He's waiting around the corner. You have to go speak to him. So I asked Casey, uh, my cameraman, just to come with me as backup because I didn't know what was going to happen. And I'll never forget <laughs> it. I, listen, I didn't know, man. And uh, I went around the corner and he was there, you know, sleeves rolled up and just said, get out. You're done. Your career is over. You'll never be at a UFC event again. And, uh, you know, we just put a bullet in your head. You're done. And, you know, obviously everything that happened afterwards is well publicized. The fans, uh, you know, had my back. And that's why I always feel like I work for the fans to a degree. And uh, I got unbanned. Now, here's here, here's where, like, revisionist history comes into play. My actual banning lasted two days, less than 48 hours. By Monday, I was back, Right. 2006, I was at UFC 200. I covered it. I was there. I was credentialed. I was at 201. I was at 202. I was at 203, etc. That was 2016. I worked for Vox MMA Fighting from 2016 to 2018. 2018, I was hired by ESPN. I went to every UFC pay-per-view when I was hired by ESPN and some of the fight nights as well. People have now just said like, oh, 2016 ban and have almost pre- now pretended that I've been banned since 2016. Mm. But... Why this has happened, I think, is the last UFC event that I applied for a credential for was March of 2020, Israel Adesanya versus Yoel Romero. The next week, the pandemic hit. And for a year and a half, uh, ESPN wasn't sending people. You know, they were just very, um, you know, they they were being very cautious about everything. And... The kind of the, the like the the, the 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 cautiousness was lifted in June of 2021. It just so happened I was leaving in June of 2021. So the plan was for me to go back to my first UFC event in June of 2021. This was Leon Edwards against um, 
against Nate Diaz, mm. Izzy versus Marvin Vittori. But I was done in two days and it was already public. And so my boss and I spoke and he's like, it might be a scene. It might be like a distraction. Maybe just stay home. It's the last one. Just stay home. <laughs> so I stayed home and I, honestly, I was happy to stay home. Okay. And so here's the thing. Since I left, sorry for the long wind. I'm trying to make it as You're short fine. as possible. You're fine. Since I left in June of 2021, I haven't applied for another credential because the way my life has gone now is like I do MMA hour Monday, Wednesday. I get the interviews. I do my Ringer MMA show Thursday, Saturday post show. It hasn't, um, it hasn't been required for me to go. And and even when they're local, like it's easier for me to sit here, watch the fights, and tape my show right after. Yep. I'll be honest. I was very much um, unwelcome. Like they they went out of their way to make my life difficult. And you know, you leave your family three four days. You fly all over the place, and like you're coming to a place where you feel like they don't really want you there. Yeah. And you know, so it's like once I left, I was like, all right, I'm good. I could still cover the sport. I could still talk to the fighters. Do I need to be sitting there? You know, I sometimes joke about this because like, do I need to sit there on press row and take the picture of the cage and say office for the night? Do I need to ask one or two questions at the press conference so that I could clip it off and put it on my Instagram? I'm good. There's enough of me to go around. So. I'm not banned. I haven't applied for credentials since March of 2020. Uh, I just kind of felt like that part of my life ran its course. You know, um, do I? the UFC is a part of my life. Like the sport is a part of my life. I don't wish bad upon them. People sometimes view my criticism as negativity or me. No, it's just like this is listen to any sports talk radio. This is what it is. You talk about the great. And I would say 90% of what I talk about, 95% is the good. And then there's, sometimes there's the bad. And so that's kind of where it is. That's why you don't hear me at the press conferences. That's why, but it's just because I'm covering the sport in a different way now. It's evolution. Yeah, Does well, that I make think sense. The, Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, no, there. no. I think it's it's important, right? Because I think you know the biggest thing I took from that story that I love was like you just started back in 2007, right? That's when you first started. It was like I'm just gonna, you know, you started with MySpace, like you said, that was the big social media platform back in the day, and then you started reach out to fighters, you started interviewing them. But the biggest thing that I want viewers to understand is that all you have to do is start. Right, that's the biggest thing people are so afraid of doing is just starting. They're everybody's so afraid of failure. They're afraid of how do I start? Where do I start? Just think about where to start. And obviously, you started this on your own, and you built yourself up so much. You built a community behind you. Now, like you said, you don't have to travel to go to the fights and all that stuff. You could cover the sport right from your house and from your studio, and you still have your loyal community following you so that's why i wanted you to tell that story because there's there's positivity in what you've gone through you battle adversity from you know you're doing your job you're breaking the fucking news before you know the promotion does and it's not like there's no law that says that you can't break news right like it, it drives me nuts when people say I leaked the news. I didn't no, leak anything. I reported no, the news. There's a massive difference. Leaking the news would imply, and this is why I got, yeah, I got mad inside. at Joe Rogan. I got mad at Joe Rogan because on the Monday after, he said he told a story on his show that never happened. It was complete fiction. He said that someone pulled me aside and told me the news. because, and Again, this is where the revisionist history, they say, oh, you were working for Fox. No, I wasn't. I, I stopped working for Fox in March. This was June. But people like mangle all the two stories together. And so Rogan said that I was pulled aside and told that there was going to be a big announcement because I was working for Fox and all this stuff and that they were going to announce the news. And I took that information and was told not to do anything and ran with it and reported it. That never happened. The yeah. same way, by the way, I broke the news that you got traded for Ben Askren. That's through sources. That's through talking to people. I mean, you. I'm not going to name names, but like you can ask the people in your life like, I hounded them for that. Like that's that's what reporting is. And so that's how I got the 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 Brock thing, just like I got a million other things back then. The irony is now I hardly ever break stuff. Um, because like my my role and my job has kind of evolved to where I care more now about getting exclusives like interviews and doing my show and a little more personality and entertainment and stuff like that. So like Mr. X fighting Mr. Y on on X date doesn't really get me excited anymore. Mm. The funny thing was that when I was at ESPN, they were obsessed with me not breaking that news. And they would tell managers and fighters like, if Ariel breaks this, we're going to cancel the fight. We're going to take it. I was like, what? Are you crazy? And so they would give the news to someone else to prop them up to make me look bad. And I was like, this is all so dumb. This is all so silly. What are we talking about? No one even, no, by the way, if they didn't ban me after that Brock thing, no one would even have remembered 
a day later who broke that news. Yeah, you know what I mean? Ex- exactly. It's all it's, so silly. Yeah, it, it breaks and everybody's like, oh, it breaks and everybody's like, oh, we're super excited about the fight. But I remember when I first started, when I first got my first contract and I would sign the contract and Matt, like, and Matt would tell me, do not tell anybody. We want to give the UFC or the promotion, the organization, the opportunity to break the news because they get all the traffic, the clickbait and all Who that cares? stuff. Uh, but I never forget when I, that I did get traded to Ben Askren. You called me and you goes, hey, is this true? And I said, Ariel, how the hell do you even know this is true? I didn't even talk to you. And he goes, don't worry, I got sources. And I was like, yes, Ariel, it is true. Good for you. All right, bye. <laughs> so you you do have trusted sources. And I don't know, I think it's Never a cool been story. wrong. Still you, batting 1,000, baby. <laughs> I love that. He goes, I don't miss. I hit and I hit and I hit and I don't miss. I That's love right. it. Um, but before we move on to the next subject, I want to take a second to thank our sponsor. This uh, We have a sponsor, NordVPN. I know me and Michael. Michael used uh, NordVPN last time he was in Brazil. I use it when I go to Singapore or Thailand or Japan because there's some of the stuff that I watch here in the States. I'm not able to use. And I believe our good guest here, Earl Hawani, has used NordVPN. I how love, has NordVPN? He, he loves uh, it. Tell people. Tell love, people how love, you love, love it. I'm not even getting paid for this. And I'll tell you, I love NordVPN. It's right here on my desktop. Um, the first time I was introduced to them, I was in Canada. It was the summer of 2021. And uh, I was there for like three, four weeks. And I wanted to watch my ESPN Plus. I wanted to watch my Disney Plus. I wanted to watch my Peacock. And they don't have See? that in Canada. And so I said to someone, how do I watch this stuff over here? Someone said, get NordVPN. Download. Super easy. Affordable price. You choose your region. I don't even know how this is legal, if I'm being honest, but it's fantastic. <laughs> you choose your you choose your region, and now all of a sudden, ESPN Plus works. Uh, Hulu works. Disney Plus works. P, all these things that you can't get in Canada. So I've had it for two years, ever since then, two plus years. And now every time I visit my family in Canada... No problem. I could get all the UFC fights. I could get the WWE pay-per-views. No problem. Uh, when I'm away, I was just using it. I was just overseas in August, and I, I used it, watched. No problem. It's a fantastic service. If you're ever stuck thinking, oh, how am I going to do this, that, stream this, that, get your NordVPN, any country, bing, bang, boom, you're good to go. And make sure when you do that, go to yeah. nordvpn.com slash mightygaming. Use my promo code. Oh. And we're taking, dude, huge <laughs> discounts. For the month of September. Can I get a promo code too? Can I? Yeah, can you I? know, I'll talk to, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to yeah. NordVPN. Maybe NordVPN can hook up the MMA hour. Earl oh, Hawani. that'd be nice. We'll, we'll try to make that connection for you, Playboy. No, but funny, funny backstory I have about the, what DJ said about me using it in Brazil. So when Tracy, Tracy Cortez, she was just on your show, Ariel, yes. and she actually mentioned in the interview, like, yeah, I had this dinner that I bought for everyone. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Paul, Paulo Costa was there and she mentioned, oh yeah, we watched like a UFC event. Uh, so what's funny is Captain Captain Eric, um, you know, we all know him, very colorful um, coach for Henry Cejudo. He kind of tasked me with, okay, we got to get the fights on. We're going to have Patricio, Pitbull's going to be here, Paulo, Tracy, can you put the fights on? It was, it was a fight night. It wasn't a pay-per-view. But in Brazil, they don't have ESPN Plus, so I'm sitting there trying to find an illegal stream, like panicking, <laughs> like, oh, all, the, all these fighters are going to be here. And then download NordVPN. Like, it's amazing how easy it was that in that, like, moment, download it use it right away change it to um U- usa obviously so that i could use the espn yeah. plus boom pop it on and i look like a hero and we could get that that infamous photo of tracy and oh, Paulo yes. that wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been possible without nordvpn wow <laughs> <laughs> so boys thank you to our sponsor nordvpn make sure you go there use Promo code Mighty Gaming. We're going to work on Eric Hawani's promo code. Who knows? It might be MMA Hour. We will talk to them. Now that we're talking, you mentioned it. UFC, the last UFC. I just want to hit on this a little bit. The main event, Alexis Grasso versus Balotip Shevchenko. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not checked out my breakdown of that, make sure you do yourself a favor. Go watch the breakdown. How in the hell did this fight end in a draw? One yeah. judge, <laughs> One judge gave... The last round to Grasso at 10 8. And when I look back on that fight, it's just because she got her back. And then they gave it a 10 8. And what it brought back memories is when I fought Ian McCall back in 2012 in Australia, that fight was also ruled a majority draw because I talked to the judge after my fight and he goes, Hey, 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 Demetrius, hey, uh, 
just want to let you know it was a great fight. And I was the one who gave you that 10 8 round. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, why'd you give why'd you give uh Ian McCall 10 8? He goes, Well, because he got your back for the last 15 seconds of the fight. I said, for 15 seconds, you give you give me a 10 8 because he had my back for 15 seconds. He goes, Yeah, yeah, I did. I was like, Jesus Christ. And to see this happen again in 2023. I was just mind blown that I had the fight scored for Shevchenko 3-2. That's what yeah. my gut was telling me. That I, I was just blown away. Michael was upset. Michael called me crying. And he was like, I lost all the money because I listened to the breakdown. And I thought, you know, you know, things were going to go opposite. But I was just so blown away that it ended in a freaking draw. No, it's uh, it's one of the most egregious and worst scorecards in the history of the sport. There's only one person on the planet that agrees with that 10-8 and it's Mike Bell the guy who gave the 10-8 and dare I say now <laughs> because he's actually a very good judge and he's he's not the kind of official that is usually on this side of the controversy the bad side mm. dare I say a few days later I would guess that he regrets it um you know you're in the moment and and these are human beings and it's a tough tr it's a tough job and and who yeah. knows what angles you're seeing but there is no one on the planet that agrees with this and i can't imagine that alexa grasso if she's being honest with herself agrees to this and i i mean there's a lot of angles that you could talk about th all this but that wasn't a 10-8 that was 3-2 for valentina uh 48 47 i thought it was a fairly easy fight to score you can make a case about the fourth round but fairly easy fight to score the fact that Valentina is not champion because of this bizarre ten eight is kind of wild. It's it's why they should do a rematch uh, or a trilogy, I should say. And 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 perhaps more importantly, like I love the fact that you actually spoke to that judge in Australia. The yeah. fact that Valentina hasn't gotten an explanation from Mike Bell as to why it was a ten eight, and the fact that the public hasn't gotten an explanation as well is crazy to me. I spoke to Jeff Mullen of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, and I was pretty much like begging him to say something publicly. There needs to be transparency. There needs to be some sort of system in place where these these calls are explained. Because let's be honest, Alexa has had to answer for it. Valentina has had to answer for it. Dana White has had to answer for it. And all of them didn't make the call. The one guy who made the call doesn't have to answer for it. And that's crazy if you ask me. And so is it a system where he talks to the press? Sure. Is it a system where the Nevada State Athletic Commission puts out a, a statement? Sure. Is it a system where we pick one media reporter and he speaks to him and we get a, like a Q&A? Sure, there has to be something. The one thing I will say that is somewhat promising is the fact that they held this on Wednesday, September 20th. They held a... Uh, a special 10-8 seminar for all the licensed <laughs> officials. So they called it. And that, to me, is an acknowledgement by Nevada that something went awry. It doesn't change the outcome. It doesn't give Valentina the belt. But at least it's some kind of an acknowledgement. But it's crazy to me that that happened. And it's crazy to me that we still don't know why it happened. Well, I, I think the big... Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Tell me, baby. Get, get it, baby. I was going to say, I was gonna say, Ariel, when are you going to have a 10-7 seminar for... Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Like, you know, I could teach... A few things or two, but uh, for now, I'll keep those uh, tricks of the trade to myself. Hey, hey, has anybody ever got given a 10-7 round before? Well, you see, this is Michael's talking about a totally different scorecard. Yeah, to me, the joke went way over that yes. bald head, uh, Demetrius. DJ, he's talking about when I go out there with the receipts and 10 7 the haters, oh. uh, when it's a one way street. You know, the people that come at the king and they yeah. best not miss. That's a 10 7. There's only one tell kind him, of baby. 10 7. It's when Hilwani's on the mic. Come on, tell him, man. Tell him, baby. Go ahead, baby. We just do a rap. We should do a rap album, all three yeah. of us. Two Jews and a black guy. It'd be great, right? Yes, it'd be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so I know, but yeah, if, if it, I don't know if you wanted to still talk on this uh, topic, Demetrius, but with the ten sevens being brought up to give Demetrius a good idea of that is uh, Dylan Dennis. <laughs> you, you are wow. you are probably the best at ten sevening that dude more than anyone. And I, and I want to say when you last had him on the show, he was in New York. He came to the studio. How do you feel He's about like, your boxing, you know, skills? Because obviously you grew up as I'm a not, jiu -jitsu I'm, not a, guy. I'm more of like a Toriel Gotti. I would yeah, say. yeah. I saw like, your I saw your clip of hitting the pads. You like that? Uh, I mean, well, you never boxed. I feel pretty confident that I could hit pads better than you. Who's the last you televised with? fight you had was in the parking lot of a Holiday Inn in Austin, Texas. When was the last time you had a fight? I'm not a fighter. Exactly, but you but talk like you one. Are you talk a like one. 
at first, I thought even for aerial standards, this is he's being pretty tough on the guy. And like, I'm going to tell you, I was sympathizing a little bit with Dennis, but when he pulled out of the fight like a couple days later, uh. then I I think I maybe did you know at the time, like I have a feeling this guy's not going to fight KSI? No, no. In fact, when the fight was first announced, I think it was announced in like mid to late ish November, and he came on in late December. I remember saying on the show, like, I'm setting the line at minus 1,000 that he's not showing up. Like, it was, like, the biggest lock of all time. And by inviting him on the show, because we had a public back and forth and all this stuff, to me was sort of like a – it was kind of like a, a peace offering. I was trying to extend the olive branch. However, he walks into the studio. This is my house, and I, and I like to think that I'm a gracious host. We gave him some coffee, a, a, a bite to eat. I like to think, you know, you, know, you have to be respectful. I extended a hand – to say like, hey man, bygones be bygones. Like, let's have a nice chat. And the fact that he didn't shake my hand I and kept that. me there, that 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 was like, all right, this is this is what we're doing here. You're not gonna shake my hand unless you apologize. Shake my hand. Come no, on, after Doug. after. You're not gonna shake my hand after. Wow, what yeah. a bitch move. You're after. seriously gonna sit here and after. not shake my hand? And so that's why I felt like it was uh, appropriate to you know to go in in the paint, as they say. No, I think you went hard into paint. I remember that interview. Yeah. And I loved it because it was an awkward situation, but you called him out on every single thing. When he was like, when was that? So you talked to Connor. He goes, oh, I don't know. I don't know. He's like, you know, when you talk to your friends, he goes, would you talk to your friend? Oh, DC, just talked to him this morning. We talked yeah, about him. It's like, it's like, dude, whatever There's you're saying. There's a lot of lies. There <laughs> yeah. were a lot of lies in that interview, unfortunately. Which is sad because, you know, we hope, you know, we've been covering his uh, build up to the Logan Paul fight. And I hope he mixes that fight because I'm invested now. I'm fully invested. I want to see what he's going to do, especially how he's been ragdolling Nina all over Twitter. It's oh, like God. E e every every day <laughs> I go on Twitter and I just see, good morning, and it's a picture of Nina. Picture of Nina. Dustin goes, who are you looking at, babe? I was like, oh, she's still a dentist just making fun <laughs> of uh, Logan Paul's Beyonce. And I was just like, Is Man. he crossing the line? Like, Okay, DJ, <sighs> you're married. You love your wife. Absolutely. She's a public figure, you know, like if anyone knows you, you, they know who your wife is. If someone did that to you, how would you feel? Well, one, I mean, honestly, I feel embarrassed, right? I'm just going to put it out there. I feel embarrassed. Two, you know, I'm blessed that me and my wife got together at the very beginning of our lives, 18 years old. So there is no track record. There is no receipts. There is right. no new pictures on anybody else's phone as far as I know. But <sighs> You know, where him just posting all these pictures and the one he posted last night, she goes, uh, I just need some big sausage to destroy my body. I ain't gonna lie, boys. Dylan had me dead that night. I was dead. <laughs> I don't know what's real and what isn't. I, I, I have long felt like, you know, wives, girlfriends, partners, husbands, like all uh, like that stuff should all be left out of fight promotion and i'm pretty liberal when it comes to fight pro like i love pro wrestling i love the showmanship like hey trash talk is great but i feel like wives partners girlfriends religion parents like all that doesn't need to be brought up and i know what some people are saying like hey you know logan has rolled in the mud he's certainly not you know a, a, a choir boy like mm. hey you know like you got to be able to to deal with this stuff but it, it did kind of go on for a long time. It's still going on. I will just say this about Dylan. Like, I, I think he is going to show up. Oh. And I, I don't wish ill towards him. Like, I actually feel like I've been one of the few people that had publicly supported him when he wasn't fighting, when he was kind of just viewed as like Connor's guy. Like, I recognize the fact that like, this guy's an accomplished BJJ practitioner, had a great run as a BJJ player, black belt, Marcelo Garcia. Like, if you know anything about that stuff, like, you have to respect. And his MMA career was starting off nicely, like two wins in Bellator. Yep. The problem is, and it doesn't get talked about enough, he suffered a really serious knee injury. The first surgery failed. The second one, you know, took some time for him to get it and all that stuff. And so like, I have a lot of questions about the state of his health and the state of his knee. And I, I just wish that he would like, it's okay to be the bad guy. It's okay to be the heel. It's okay to poke the bear. It's okay to do all that stuff. I just think there's a line. That's all. I, I, and and with me, like he does it with me too. He like, he gets personal with me. And I just like, who the, f I'm not fighting you. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm just a reporter. So it's a bizarre thing, but I don't wish ill upon him. 
Well, I think at the end of the day, that's what everybody loves. They love the controversy. They love when somebody can find an angle in somebody's head, right? Because you think about it, you look at Logan Paul, his track record. Yeah, he's done some pretty, you know, harsh things. But as far as to get to get to him, you know, it just so happens that Nina and Dylan Dennis have had a past, right? Like, I believe they dated before. And Did so they? It's, I think Are you sure they, about that? No, 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 D DJ, that's fake news. Oh, well, you got me. Uh, Good job, Dylan. You got me. Some, you yeah, got me. I don't think they did. <laughs> no, no, that's some that's some fake some bad Photoshop jobs and stuff like that. <laughs> well, I guess I you know I have wow, 2015 DJ, vision. He got DJ me. What do you want it? from me? Hold on. What do you want from me? Right? <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> Those are the worst photoshops. I think he makes them bad like on purpose. Some of them I think were good, but yeah. Here, here's the thing though, like if you want to go there, fine, 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 fine. But like, at what point you? At what point does it, it, it? If you didn't know any better, you would think that on October 14th, Dylan is fighting Nina. Like, at what point does it become about? You got you got to change the 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 target. No, like, doesn't it have to be more about Logan, right? At some point, or is this enough? I don't is think Logan's enough? big. I don't think Logan's bigger than Nina, so that's why I think he keeps on attacking Nina. <laughs> Golly, it's unbelievable. I will say this though. How about the fact that? You know, like, remember when, when Dylan pulled out in January of the KSI fight, like, his Q rating couldn't have been lower. Like, everyone was like, wow, you're pulling out of KSI, man? Like, you're a BJJ black belt, you're a Bellator fighter, and, and, and you won't fight KSI in a boxing match, with all due respect? And I think that he was like, in the, you remember he disappeared, he didn't say anything, this and that. The baby face turn, the love and support that he has gotten mm -hmm. while doing all this is sort of a fascinating commentary on society or maybe social media right because it does seem like you look at his 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 engagement in the comments and a lot of it is support oh yeah yeah i mean like i said for a gentleman who hasn't done anything in mixed martial arts or any combat anything in combat sports for obviously some years due to his knee injuries and playing on the ksi fight he is you know one of the most talked about athletes now, just because he's, you know, ragging on Logan Paul's fiance, but yeah, and, and a lot of people support him. So I'm looking forward to fight. I hope, fingers crossed, dear Lord, baby Jesus, please make sure uh, Dylan Dennis makes it to the fight. I'll hope every night before he goes to bed, he has a nice warm glass of milk that that beautiful hair of his can grow into whatever it is. Will so, you watch it? Hell, you got damn right I'm watching that fight. Who wins? Ooh, man. Have you made your prediction yet? I I haven't made my final prediction yet, but right now I'm I'm leaning towards Logan Paul. It's a boxing match, right? Logan Paul, phenomenal wrestler. I've seen him wrestle Ricochet. Uh, oh, that kind of wrestler, just a pro wrestling. Pro wrestling, absolutely yeah, yeah. I mean, tremendous, he, tremendous. Um, and you know, boxing, boxing is boxing. You know, I don't know how Dylan's gonna come out. You know, Dylan, sh I I just don't know, man. So if I if I was a betting man, I'll bet on Logan Paul. I mean. I just think he's he's younger, he's healthier, he's more athletic. You know, if it was MMA, I give it to Dylan Dennis any day of the week. But it's not MMA; it's boxing. So we'll see. You best believe I'll be tuning into that fight, and I'll also be doing a live reaction. And we also have more breakdowns coming for him, oh. uh, for Logan Paul and Dylan Dennis. So stay tuned out, ladies and gentlemen. By the All way, right. will you do the same for KSI Tommy Fury, or you only care about? No, uh, we we will try to do. Uh, we'll do a live reaction for KSI and Tommy Fury. We try to do a breakdown for Tommy uh, KSI, but KSI has this stuff on lockdown for YouTube. So unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen. You do not get a breakdown from Mighty uh. with the KSI stuff, so, which is all good. You know, KSI, he's good. Uh, his last fight, he hit somebody with the forearm, so it's yes. actually a, a forearm hit instead of like punch so that should have been ruled a no contest but you know it was in the end they changed it oh they did so yes. he's oh so yeah when we watched the face off he didn't bring that up tommy fury and we we broke that down and tom fury was like you elbowed a guy and he goes i still knocked him out and i was like well yeah you knocked him <laughs> out it's like if i was a headbutt him and i knocked him out does that count i i don't understand what Damn, you're trying you to did get a at. breakdown for the freaking face off like you're all in on this huh oh i i'm, I'm fully invested we're, me and michael we're invested so that's why i hope these 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 two these two fights go dylan dennis versus logan paul and uh ksi versus tommy fury so yeah we're invested can i, can I make a request absolutely there's a, guy, there's a absolutely. guy on that card 
I, you know, I, I'm sort of like in and out of the influencer. Like, you know, I appreciate it. I have nothing against it. Do I know all the players? No, I would never pretend that I do. But there's a guy who's fighting on that card named Salt Poppy. Are you familiar oh, yeah. with Salt Poppy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know who Salt Poppy is. I, I need a DJ breakdown of Salt. Salt Poppy's pretty good. He and is. He's lost a ton of weight. Have you seen him? He looks yes. fantastic. Yes, he looks fantastic. He actually has, he actually moves. Yes. Like the closest thing relative to a, a, a true boxer and what i mean true boxer somebody who's had like amateur fights who actually has some type of formal curriculum in boxing he moves like it so yes you know what we will do a breakdown of soft poppy uh oh. since um er hawani wants it and michael we, we can do that correct maybe no exactly and, and kind of sticking on that topic a little bit there's dj and i learned very early in, in working with each other on youtube like people just love the the Logan Paul, the Dylan Dennis, um, the the Andrew Tate. And you really have to have no ego about it if you're going to be successful in the YouTube game because it is pretty funny having DJ just break down. He broke down Dylan Dennis's. We called it a street fight, but it was him just getting sucker punched. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> and that I saw gets that. like that gets like 200,000 views. So it's uh, what do you, what's your you you talked about a little bit, Ariel, but what's your take on the whole if you want to call it the celebrity boxing, the celebrity combat sports, that kind of crossover. Cause my take on it is you look at UFC, there's, there's no hiding. If you look at whoever you want to say, the second company is behind UFC, they are so far off. So if, if you're really thinking in all of combat sports, this is probably the easiest way for a former MMA fighter to make money. So for, for me personally, looking out for the fighters, I like it for that reason. Um, what's what's your take on oh, this whole 100%. crossover thing? I, I mean, from that angle, 100%. I mean, just ask Tyron Woodley, mm -hmm. ask Anderson Silva, ask Ben Askren. They've all benefited from it. Uh, just Wednesday on my show, The MMA Hour, I was talking to Jessica Rose Clark, and she said that she wants to get signed by MVP and fight Paige Van Zandt. Like, you know, this is just the new path. And honestly, if Bellator goes away, uh, that's not great for the fighters. And we could get into that. Uh, that's one less place for for someone to make money, right? That's one less option. So it's good that there is this option. Who knows how long it will last? But ultimately, like from a sporting standpoint, like of course, you know, I get up, you know, and and excited for you know Izzy versus Pereira and uh, John Jones Stipe and Alex versus Yuri and Leon Cole. Like that to me is the creme de la creme. But like I said, I don't take myself seriously. Uh, I like pro wrestling. I like that it's different. It's fun. As long as the fights are evenly matched and it's not mismatches and no one's going to go out there to get slaughtered and truly hurt, I have no problem with it. They're clearly taking it seriously. They're training. They're working hard. They're in shape. They're, they're doing their best, appropriate to what their level is. And in addition to that, they're giving opportunities to actual fighters. I mean, just ask a guy like... Anthony Pretty Boy Taylor. He was just kind of like a journeyman in Bellator, kind of bouncing around. Now he's like a big star in the influencer boxing world because he was smart enough to, you know, latch on to that train. And now he's uh, he's doing things. He actually beat Saul Poppy in his last fight. So uh, I have no problem with it. It's fun. It's different. Um, you know, I've worked the MVP cards, some of them, uh, for Showtime, for DAZN, as DJ you know, kind of mentioned there, you know, mentioned maybe that I'll be a part of this other one, breaking that news. Uh, so like the, there, there's, there's, <laughs> there, there, there's a little something for everyone. It's fun. It's different. Uh, you know, is it, is it Crawford Spence? Is it Canelo Charlo? No, but I think there's a lot of that and it's okay to have something a little bit different from time to time. Yeah, I agree. And it's kind of crazy. So you saying Bellator might not be around anymore. If that's the case, Bellator, please have, uh, just do the Patchy Mix versus Sergio Pettis. Oh, yeah, that's happening. That, that, okay, good, because that's the only fight that I want to see because it's always weird. When we, it's not weird. I always get happy when I see athletes when they leave the UFC and they go off to a different organization and they succeed, right? You look at, you know, obviously Francis Nagano, he left the UFC. He's about to fight Tyson Fury, and then he'll fight hopefully in PFL. Then you have me. I left to one championship. I became successful. I did get knocked the fuck out, but we, we rallied back and got the belt. And then you look at uh, Sergio Pettis is one of those guys where he didn't fight for the belt in the UFC, but he left, went to Bellator. And I don't think he got beat at Bellator yet. He had a knee injury. I think he tore his ACL and he became the champion being a Kyojo Horiguchi. And then now he's about to fight the winner of the Bellator Grand Prix with Patchy Mix. 
And I'm super excited about that fight. So I hope Bellator. Love that fight. S- save your money. Do whatever the fuck you got to do. But just have those two fight. And then do whatever the hell you want with it. And well, then, yeah, you're right. It will, it will give less places for athletes to go and fight. But then again, you know, if the athlete can find an angle like Nate, Ben, Tyron, they can make their way into the influencer boxing and make money that way too. I just want to make make clear when I say that um, Bellator might be going away. It's because Bellator might be sold. Uh, there's a lot of rumors regarding Bellator potentially being sold to the PFL, mm. um, merging with the PFL, or maybe another suitor. So Bellator 299 was on Saturday. There's 300 coming up, and then there's 301. That's the patchy mix one. Mm. Uh, I suspect... By January 1st, we'll know the status of Bellator. Viacom wants to sell Bellator. PFL really wants to buy Bellator. And PFL's TV deal with um, ESPN is up at the end of this year. So they want to get a better roster, a more robust roster. So it's a really interesting story to follow from a business standpoint. The one negative I would just say is if you're a free agent, whether it's a free agent from one, UFC, PFL, that's now one option that may go away. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, it's it, it, well. If it does sell to PFL, right? I wonder if they'll still have it, because you know how Bellator and Rising they have this kind of like bromance going on, right? They can share each other's fighters, Scott Coker and uh, I believe it's because uh, you Sakuraba. No, they, it's Sakakibara. Sakakibara. My apologies. Sakakibara. Sakuraba is a legendary fighter. Hey, hey. <laughs> Sa- Sakuraba's <laughs> fighting uh, Mikey, right? No, that's Shinyaoki. Oh, Shinyaoki. Oh. Yeah, no, I just. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Did I miss? What in the... <laughs> no, Shinya. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Sakuraba's, the gra- Sakuraba's the Gracie, Gracie killer. Yes. Uh, I love it. So, but if Rise... So, if Bellator gets sold to PFL, then you have... You don't have that that cr- cross promotion that we always dream of seeing, right? You always... I love when I see Ryzen and Bellator co-promote because I, I love when I saw AJ McGee go over there, uh, McKee go over there and fight uh, yeah. Roberto, Roberto Satoshi. So I love that fight. So if that happens, that is going to be sad because I don't know if PFL will still play ball no. with Ryzen. They're like, not nah, like it's going to happen. And then it, it does take away one extra home for athletes to go and compete. But, you know, at least if that does happen, Sergio, the Pettis Bros would be under the same banner again with Showtime. I don't know if Anthony is still fighting professionally. I know he's doing boxing, but I don't know if he's doing any more MMA. Well, the interesting thing is uh, Sergio Pettis is a 135-pound champion, at least as of right now. Apologies for the dog, by the way. That's Macha. The doorbell rings. You know, they go crazy. Uh, as of right this second, PFL doesn't have a 135-pound division. Mm. So would they just try to absorb? Also, worth remembering, it's not fed accompli as they say in that when zufa bought pride not everyone went over right like initially mm. you know remember like there was some guys took a little while fedor never went over etc when zufa bought strike force not everyone went over initially as well and so uh it remains to be seen how the contracts are but here's can i tell you what my idea is my dream of my course. dream is if in fact they buy bellator pfl you know how they have the 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 season format yep. and they have like, you know, the welterweights, they have the 205 heavyweight. So let's say there's going to be 10 fighters per weight class and then they have their little season with the points and the stuff. And actually, you know, longtime viewers of Arrow and the Bad Guy will remember Chael and I used to argue about this all the time. I hated the format. I, I, I thought it was silly. <laughs> I thought it was just like too complicated. Now I actually have very much warmed up to it because... I think it's their thing that they have that's different than the UFC. Like back in the day, you know, uh, let's say uh, Strike Force, right? Strike Force and Elite XC, they had the women's division. That was yeah. different. UFC didn't have it. Now they have it. So this is their thing that makes them different. It's great. But my idea is this. Let's say you're, you'll have like six or seven weight classes, 135, 145, 155, et cetera, and you pick five PFL fighters and five Bellator fighters. And so they represent the brand. And so mm. now people are like, oh, who's better? And now you're getting like all these kind of like mini super fights leading up to the championship. And you see how many PFL guys made it, how many Bellator guys made it. And you mm. see who's the dominant. And then after year one, you roll them in together and it's just the PFL moving forward. What do you think? What do you think? I mean, that'd be dope just to be able to have that opportunity to have like five P- Bellator, five PFL. Shit, why, why stop at Bellator? Why not do five Bellator, five PFL, five? Five one championship, 
five UFC well, now we're guys. Getting crazy. Uh, is that what's about, that, baby? That, that, getting crazy? Come on now. That, you said it's a dream. Well, no, because they're going to buy him, so they're going to own the fighter. You know, they're going to own the contracts. One championship will require co-promotion, and that gets super tricky. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Well, it would be dope if, you know, hey, guys, like if we're all like, I mean, we are self, um, you know, self employed contractors, but if we all could just go pick like, hey, Belgio's doing this tournament. If you guys enter it, you get $10 million if you win it. Can I put my hat in it? Like, that would be dope to have the opportunity. But back to your dream, five Bellator, five PFL, and see who makes it to the top. Yeah, I think it'd be dope. Like, I think anytime you have any type of cross promotion going on, it's always going to be a good time because I've always enjoyed when Ryzen and Bellator did that. And I believe Bellator, don't they have a 125-pound cla weight class too? Because I remember Kyojo Horiguchi was supposed to fight. I mean, he did fight, yeah. but it stopped in a uh, eye poke, I believe. So Yes, it's a very weird thing. And so, who does knows? That, so does that division go to PFL? And if it does, it gives uh, 125ers around the world another house to go and, and compete at. So, because right now in the world, 125, I think LF, LFA has one, one chip ship has one, but that's straw weight and you have to make that hydrated. And then you have Bellator and Ryzen now. So if they get absorbed by PFL, hopefully they keep the 125 pound division and go from there. So we'll see, we'll see. Now, another thing, I wanted to ask, uh, MMA Hall of Fame, Let, let's start off there. You know, I was literally sitting here before we jumped on this call, uh, not call, but before we started the podcast, like MMA Hall of Fame and the greatest of all time, right? Th those things kind of go hand in hand. <clears throat> what, in your opinion, does it take somebody to be, you know, introduced into the MMA Hall of Fame? We're not just talking about the UFC Hall of Fame. We're talking about... MMA Hall of Fame in, in in general, right? Because obviously you have greats like Fidio Milenko, Mirko Krokop, uh, you know, uh, the Noguera brothers. Obviously they fought in the UFC, but you have a lot of guys who never stepped foot into the UFC that will never make the UFC Hall of Fame because everybody in the world recognizes the UFC Hall of Fame, not Mixed Martial Arts Hall of Fame. So if that was to happen, what would be like the curriculum or the credentials somebody would need to make it in there. Like for me, I think they should be able to fight on both sides of the world, right? Which is of course not not possible for a guy like John Jones, right? He he never has ever stepped foot on Eastern soil, right? So would that like disqualify him for the MMA Hall no, of Fame no. or what? Like no, no, that's crazy talk right there. That's crazy talk. First of all, this is this is one of my great dreams. This mm. is one of the things that I would love to see happen in this sport because I'm a big fan of history of sports history and of combat sports history like recently we had this noche ufc event um oh, celebrating God. mexican uh independence day and i my, one of my one of my favorite parts of the broadcast and shout out to a uh, former colleague of ours well like for he's still at espn but a former colleague of michael and i's um gonzo alex who put mm. together this great package with Gilbert Melendez voicing it about the history of fighting and in particular boxing on Mexican Independence Day, we get, I feel like MMA and the UFC in particular, I'm not trying to knock them, but it's just a criticism. They don't honor and talk and showcase the history of the sport enough. And so there's a UFC Hall of Fame, and I think that's a great thing. And I think it's important to celebrate the history of the UFC, and I love that they do it on International Fight Weekend and all this stuff. Just like WWE has their own Hall of Fame, just yep. like the Knicks have jerseys hung up on in the rafters of Madison Square Garden, every sports team has their own version of a Hall of Fame. But I think it is crucial, it is very important that every sport has its own independent Hall of Fame. The Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, is not the NFL Hall of Fame. It's the Football Hall of Fame. The Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts, is the Basketball Hall of Fame, not the NBA Hall of Fame. Mm. There is a Boxing Hall of Fame in Catastota, New York. That's not the Top Rank or the Match Room or the Don King Hall of Fame. It's the Boxing Hall of Fame. There needs to be an independent mixed martial arts Hall of Fame. Why? So that people, young fans, old fans, can go and learn about the sport, the history of the sports, the roots of the sport, and not just the roots of the UFC, which is important, but can learn about everything. The, the founding fathers, the ups and downs, the prides, the IFLs, the elite XCs. And it could be a place where legends who didn't fight in the UFC 
can be honored, can have a home, can bring their family, memorabilia could be shared. Like all these things are crucial. And so more important than like the criteria right now, I think something that really needs to happen is an independent MMA Hall of Fame. Like to me, I can't quite get over the fact that we don't have one and there's no talks of having one. It's criminal that we don't have one. And I feel like the sport will only be viewed as like, you the know, UFC, the, this, 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 it, the UFC. <laughs> yes, there needs to be a, a there needs to be a place where we honor the history, where every year everyone comes together and everyone's welcome, and there's no bias. It's very, very important. This needs to happen. Well, it's kind of crazy you said that. You said the IFL. You brought up, uh, you know, I'm getting all it, fired it, up it, here. I have to take off my sweatshirt because I'm getting all <laughs> fired up talking about the damn Hall of Fame. Golly. I mean, you you mentioned IFL, International Fight League, a uh, Strike Force, Elite XC, uh, show. Uh, I think there's show. Elite XC, I believe. I think it was on Showtime. It was called Show XC. That was your Challenger XC. series. That's what yeah. it is. So many things. And it's funny because that is the history of mixed martial arts, right? Like a lot of those shows brought up some of the best fighters in the world, right? Or even uh, a Cage cage, fight, cage Warriors, I believe it was. Uh, cage it, Rage, Cage, cage Warriors. Rage, yeah. uh, Elite XC. I mean, I remember when Matt Hume fought Pat Militich. That was an underground show too. And then you also have Pancras because Pancras is kind of like a form of mixed martial arts, even though it's open hand slaps and you have boss roots to come from there. But that is a good point you bring up because right now everybody thinks of, when you think of the U.S., if some people ask me, like, Demetrius, do you ever think you'll make it in the UFC Hall of Fame? I'm like, well... Why does it have to be the UFC Hall of Fame? Why are you only recognizing just the UFC Hall of Fame? Why not just the Hall of Fame of mixed martial arts where all the greatest athletes in the sport of mixed martial arts get the opportunity to be recognized? And it'd be cool to have you know, a nice little brick and border where people go there and look yes, at remember Billy take your and, family <clears throat> and, and, yeah. and 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 so by the way, right now the UFC Hall of Fame, you know what it is? It's it's a it's a it's a wall. Up the staircase at the UFC PI, there's a couple of plaques. That's the UFC Hall of Fame. There isn't even a physical... You can make a strong case that there should be a physical UFC Hall of Fame as well somewhere in Las Vegas, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to get cheeky, you could put it in Denver because that was the site of UFC 1. But mm -hmm. Las Vegas probably makes the most sense. People can make pilgrimage. But it is crucial for a sport to be taken seriously to have a Hall of Fame where... And, and by the way, just for the record, you know this. You don't need me to tell you this. <laughs> you, you would be in the UFC Hall of Fame. Whenever you decide to walk away, you would be a first ballot shoe in. You should be, you know, if it's next year, this year, whenever it is, like you should be recognized, you should be celebrated, you should be inducted. But I would love a day where, you know, some of the forgotten people are recognized. And let's be honest, some of the people that may have butted heads with the UFC, the Frank Shamrocks of the world, mm -hmm. who aren't in the Hall of Fame, have a place where they could go and be celebrated as well. Absolutely. Man, I think we hit everything, man. I think the biggest thing that I've always been so impressed by you, Ariel, is how you have just an encyclopedia of the sport of what happened, when this happened. And I just always been so amazed. Like, how, how the hell is that possible? If I said, I'm going to test mine here, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. What UFC was it? Tyson, Tyson Griffin versus Frankie Ager. Go. That's a hard one. I know. UFC UFC seventy six. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll have the viewers check if that's correct. Or Michael, can you check to see my if that's correct? My, it's either sixty seven or seventy six. My my hands are here. Yeah, so. yeah I'm, I'm look. I'm looking right now. Get him, Michael. He he's bad. <laughs> so you said you said Ty, Tyson Griffin versus Frankie Edgar. Yes, sir. Is what we said. Uh, so looking right now, it looks like it was UFC 67. Oh, you got it right. You say 67 or 76. Yeah, yeah okay. La ladies Come on, and gentlemen, man. Th Come this, this, on. <laughs> but that's what I mean. And like, that's a pretty I, I, freaking I, random fight, by the way, for you to I just know. drop on me like that. Did you did you say 67 or 76? I'm not sure. No, I said, said, I said it's either 76 or 67. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. yeah. yeah. No, I mean, that's, uh, that's insane. The, the, the reason why I brought that up, because I remember that's the first time I saw Frankie Ager and Tyson Griffin yes. fight. I was at Hooters, and I was like, oh, that, that's a cool fight. So that just came in the back of my mind. But it's crazy how you can do that. If I was so, to go, so if you ask me any main event... It's it's really from like UFC sixty six to like it starts to get a little shoddy around okay, like here here's another one. Here's another yeah. one. Uh Demetrius Johnson versus Chris Carriasso. When was that? Okay, and, and, and first of all, uh this is for the pay per views, I just want to say, right? Like if you ask me fight night for yes, This is this is pay per view. A, this yes, is a pay per view. Super easy one. UFC one seventy eight. 
That is correct. correct. That is Come correct. On, man. Okay. That was, that, that, was, that, was, that was Connor and, and, and Dustin. That was freaking Eddie Alvarez, Donald Cerrone. Come on, dog. You see? That's and you why, were supposed that's... to fight. By the way, weren't you not supposed to fight at UFC 176 in Sacramento and it got bumped to? Or so, like they moved you around. They You were supposed to be the co-main and then they moved you because John Jones and DC, John Jones got hurt. And so they, they moved it. Remember that? That was uh, UFC 197. 177. 177. Was it 177? Yes, it was. I guess because you might be right. Because no, I remember no, I was, I I remember I be right. I was I, right. I, was, <laughs> I am right. I was supposed <laughs> to fight. Uh, okay, so if I was I was supposed to fight on the John Jones card, and yes. it was supposed to be John Jones versus uh, Daniel Cormier, but Daniel Cormier got hurt, so OSP stepped in, and then I remember oh, that was one ninety seven. That was one ninety seven. One ninety seven. Yeah. Yes. And I was supposed to fight. I fought Henry Suhu. Did I fight Henry Suhu that night? Yes, you did. You did. Yes. yes. I fought Henry Suhu that night. And I remember doing, I spent like two and a half hours doing the promo for that fight. And they did some cool stuff. And then they didn't in, even use it because DC got hurt. And I was uh. like, so that two hours of shooting me in the studio with my shirt off, where's all that footage? Oh, we can't use it now since DC's not going. I was so, so fucking mad. And I was like, can I get it for social media purposes? But. The way you have the memory. Hit me, one. Hit me with another one. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Hit him with one. Hit him with one, Michael. Hit him. Just throw out an. <laughs> okay, uh, Demi. Let's see. Um, We're only doing yeah, DJ I, I want to do a. I want to do a paper. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Horaguchi. Horaguchi? Montreal? UFC 185? Come on. <laughs> one, 186. Ha ah, ha, gotcha. <laughs> It was Montreal. Of course it, it was, was Montreal. Montreal. Oh, yeah. Why did I say 185? I got too cocky. Uh, by the way, that was the last show in Montreal. That was, By you? the way, th this is the last show in Montreal. There hasn't been a show. That's my hometown. And um, funny story. You probably don't remember this. This is okay. actually kind of crazy. Uh, I love these stories. By the way, we're taping this on September 21st. I hope you don't mind me saying. Ten years ago today, UFC 165, arguably the greatest title fight of all time, John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson won in Toronto. So mm. happy anniversary to those guys. Uh, what a fight. Anyway, um, by the way, did you fight on... Did you fight... I, no, I jo fight Joseph Benavides fought on that one yeah. in Toronto. Wait, did you fight... I think you fought Joe B on that one. No, that was UFC 152 where he fought uh, oh, right, John right, Jones. Toronto. Also mm. Toronto. Uh, Vitor Belford fought John Jones, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Bisping made fun of Joby. Speaking of Bisping, you fought in Montreal against Horiguchi. Yep. And, and uh, we were supposed to do a sit-down in your hotel room uh -huh. in Montreal. Oh, yes. On the Thursday. You yep. got very sick. You yep. weren't feeling well. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, you couldn't do it. So I ended up calling uh, Michael Bisping and asked him if he could do a sit down with me. This is when I was doing a lot of those like in the hotel room ones, yep. which were great. I really enjoyed those. And um, Bisping was coming off the submission loss to Luke Rockhold. Mm -hmm. And so everyone was like, all right, that's it. You're done. Like you, you know, he was fighting CB Dalloway on that card. Yep. And I remember asking him, all right, how's the rest of the career going to play out? And he said, I'm going to beat CB Dalloway. And then I'm going to go fight this summer, which he did. He fought Talos Ladies. Then I'm going to get a big fight after that. He did Anderson Silva. And then around like next summer or so, I'll probably be in line for another title shot. And I was like, fucking hell, this guy is delusional. <laughs> like there is no chance. And lo and behold, it happened. He fought Anderson Silva. He gets the fight against Luke Rockhold and he became champion. It's in that clip. So because you got sick, I got to have that crazy moment with Michael Bisping. See, when one door closes, another one opens, right? So... Yeah, I, I love Michael Bisman because I remember when we fought in that card, I was he won his fight and he was in the back and I there was a picture of him in underwear and he's dancing like this, <laughs> like celebrating and I'm getting my back massaged by Matt and get rid of the fight. And I me and Michael Bisman I fought in the same card a lot. Like UFC 186, UFC 152, because I believe he fought I can't remember who he fought that night when I was about to fight Joseph Benavides. Brian Stan? Was it Brian Stan? I think it was Brian Stan. Yeah. Because uh, he was at the Coldplay concert. But, and yeah. then you look at Michael Bisbee's uh, career now. He's an analyst. I think he just signed on to do a movie. I'm not sure what movie it is, but he's acting now. So I think that's what every athlete's dream is, is to be able to win the world title, be successful in commentating. He has a very good YouTube as well. <clears throat> and then now he's doing movies. Um, 
So by the way, can I ask when you were getting ready for a fight, like in a situation like that, and then someone comes back either with great energy, like they're celebrating, but you're, you still got the nerves. You're about to make the walk or like bad energy. They just lost. They got their heart broken. Did that ever bother you? Did it ever affect you that you were like mixing with their energy? No, not at all. Cause I remember when I was uh, about to fight, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was uh, Kat Zagana was in the back. And this is after she had that traumatic loss in her family. And she was stepped back into the cage. And she was so stressed, so stressed. And I remember talking to her. I was like, hey, it's just a fight. It's just a fight. Trying to like give her some more morale. Like, hey, just chill out. It's going to be a fight. You've been here. You're a professional. Uh, and then, then I remember being in the back with Michael Bisbee. He comes back there. He's pretty much butt-ass naked, dancing <laughs> all around. And I'm like, I got to fight still, but I'll party with you just a little bit. <laughs> so uh, for me, I've always been focused in, in enjoying living in the moment, but I've never let somebody's energy affect mine. If anything, I try to give some of my energy to them to let them know if they're sad, try to lift, uplift them. And if they're happy, try to join the party. <laughs> <laughs> well put, well put. So, Michael, uh, anything you have for... Oh, before we go, what are your predictions on the upcoming fight? So, we have... I know you don't follow one championship as much, but we do have big fights coming up. Uh, September 29th, Amazon Prime, Stamp Fair Texas defending... Not defending, trying to win the world championship against Ham. Uh, I don't know if you know those athletes. Who do you got going with Stamp Fair Texas versus Ham? Who do you got? Okay, first of all, a little bit uh, insulting the way you couch that. I mean, like, oh, I've had I've had Stan Peritex on my show for goodness sakes, TikTok superstar, striking superstar. I mean, mm. really, a bit insulting. I'm sorry, uh, Errol. I'm a big God, fan. Of, what do you want from me? Okay, I'm a bit I, I, I'm a bit offended, but I'm very impressed with Stamp. Uh, I enjoy watching her fight and she's evolved into a great MMA fighter as well. Like, you know, that wasn't really her thing. And uh, she's come over and done great things. So uh, Ham is super tough, but I'll go with Stamp. She's rolling. She's a superstar. I think she wins. Very nice. I apologize, Errol. You, you don't not have to, to be the best. Not, to, be the best. not to interrupt, but one... But that reminded me of one one interesting thing I wanted to ask you about because I love how Chael just as I'm wearing the arrow and the bad guy hat, I love the dynamic that Chael has on Twitter of just like shitting on you and burying you. Where, where, it's not very where, nice. Where, where did where did this where did this side of Chael uh, come from, and how, how much of it is a, is a gimmick, and how much of it is him uh, actually trying there to bury you? Sometimes where I send him the tweet, and I, I'm like, really? Like, I know. and then he'll send me. He's like, hey pal. He'll send me like a voice note. He's like, hey pal. You, you weren't bothered by that, right? I mean, like, that was just me trying to say hello, like, letting you know that, you know, I was thinking of you. That's all, bud. You know, everything good. And and I actually believe him when he says that. But that you sometimes read it, and I'm like, did Chael get hacked? What is going on? Why is he being so mean to me right now? Oh Chael God. doesn't follow anyone on Twitter, but I know he what he does. He goes on his Twitter, and he searches for people's names, like, the, who he wants to see. And that's how he f- does Twitter. So he'll search my name, and he'll see things, and something will draw his ire, and then he'll, like, respond to it. But actually, speaking of Iron the Bad Guy, like the first few episodes of that show, I remember saying to someone like, I don't know if this is going to work because Chill was actually being like very contentious towards me in the show because he was always very used to me interviewing him. Like I ask him a question, I shut up, he says his piece, and then I ask him another question. But what they wanted with that show was us, you know, arguing, Bantering. debating, right? Like PTI or first take, whatever. And it was fine, but I don't think he was used to me in that role. So there were a couple times you go back to like the early days and like he was really getting mad at me, like where I was like, holy crap, this guy's really pissed. But then I think we ended up working really well together and I was bummed, you know, I was really bummed that that ended. I was bummed that the show with DC ended. Uh, that, that was a lot of fun as well. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, maybe rekindle it one day. One day. I loved it. I love when you guys go like, Charlie has a very interesting person. Let me tell you something, guys. Yeah. Remember whole Wadi, how the way he talks and his glasses and the bad guy shit. He goes, West Oregon, I'm a true gangster. I was like, you ain't no f***ing gangster, dog. Yeah. Um, I like no, it. He's I great. think it's good. He's great. He's amazing theater. Yeah. All right, man. I truly appreciate you, Erho Wadi, coming on the show, man. You're always welcome here. Um, Thank you love sitting here talking to you we you know michael's excited because he goes yeah we get to put we get to put ariel in the hot seat now i was like ariel he don't miss 
he hits what hot thousand. seat this is your hot seat golly <laughs> you guys need to by the way you guys need to regroup and come back with some tougher questions if this is your hot seat all right i come, they asked me by the way i want everyone to know is there anything you're afraid to speak about i was like what you kidding me i'll take all comers no problem you ask me whatever you want and uh, we could do this round two, three. By the way, I owe you like 50 interviews for the amount of interviews that you've given me over the years. So whatever you need, that was the best. The best one was when you got mad and put out that statement about the TJ Dillashaw. That was the best. You were on vacation. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. Remember that one? That was oh, an yeah. amazing one. Oh, yeah. I, I don't get triggered much in life. I, you I, were I, pissed. I, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a quick story real quick. So I went and did a charity event. Uh, I think it was Monday. We went golfing. And, you know, you're golfing. And in, on the golf courses, sometimes there are, there are homes. I go through my life respecting everybody, being gracious to everybody. Help, I try to help everybody that I come across. These motherfuckers, I, we hit the ball. It pops fly. It goes over to the left by a house. And we say, four, four heads, heads. The ball lands. We jump in the cart. We go down. This guy comes and goes, hey, man, what the f***? You almost hit me. I said, I got out of the cart. I said, hey. I said, dude, you're on a f***ing golf course. What do you think is going to hit you in the head? We said forward. He goes, yeah, but I have my guys working. Once again, you're on a f***ing golf course. Guess what, buddy? You got f***ing 30 more people coming behind me, so buckle the f*** up. <laughs> I, I, I was literally ready to fight. Like, my anxiety, I don't have anxiety, but my my senses, like, rose extremely high like I was about to fight and I was like don't call me like that like how he should have approached me was like hey dude excuse me I'm sorry but I have guys who are working here um you almost hit us next time could you you know give us a heads up when you guys about to tee off I just want to make sure I can protect my my, my workers if he would approach me that way with that type of decency and kindness he wouldn't got a bat out of hell out of the golf cart ready to fight but you know so to bring it back to the TJ thing yeah in UFC trying to like oh you better do this I was like no cl close the motherfucking division I don't care like when I did that there came a point in time when I think every athlete needs to take advantage of the leverage they have right mm -hmm. if a company wants something from you and it's not in your contract to be obligated to give them that then you don't have to do that. So when they offered me to fight TJ Dillashaw, I said, yeah, we can do it. You can pay me a million dollars since it's a super fight. And two, if TJ doesn't make 125, then we fight for his belt because I knew TJ could not make 125 healthy. We knew that. And fast forward, you know, that fight was supposed to happen in what, 2015, I believe, 15, 16, yeah. around that area. Fast forward, when he goes down to 125 to fight Henry Cejudo, he pops for EPO. And I actually saw TJ Doshaw at Disneyland. And I went to him. I said, TJ, why, why did you why did you say all those mean things about me? Why'd you say that? <laughs> he goes, he, he goes, come on, man. You know, I'm just trying to get a fight. I'm trying to sell the fight. And I was like, you don't have to say mean things about me. And then I said, so why did you do it? And he says, honestly, I was trying to make history. I, I, each time I tried to make the weight class, I'd wake up and I was crashing. I had no energy. So I started to take, and all this is public documented, but I asked yeah. him man to man. He goes, well, I started taking it because, you know, my blood started crashing. So I needed to take the EPO to get my blood, my red blood cells caught back up. So for me, I think I try to go through life transparent, being honest, helping people, not, you know, be little anybody but yeah so that was a funny thing yeah what a you did break that story it was a great no you came on the show and you freaking dropped fire it was like <laughs> it was a different side of you and now and, and that was like even before we would now you drop an f-bomb every second word but this was like squeaky clean dj era so it was great great times great memories congrats on everything that you guys are doing big fan love it i love the quality i'm uh, dare i say envious you're putting me to shame it's unbelievable. <laughs> so keep it up. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Mighty Cast episode four. Our host, Earl Hawani. I am, I hate saying this because it's not just my show. It's mine and Michael Wanzover. We wow. are your, your host. I'm Demetri Johnson. That's Michael Wanzover. And we will see you guys in the next one. We out. Good shit, boys. Good shit. <laughs>